Hamish Anderson, the woman of the Glen. Some thoughts on Highland history. Historians who write about the Highland clearances, the infamous mass evictions in which, as Karl Marx stated in Das Kapital, areas as big as German principalities were systematically and brutally cleared of their inhabitants, invariably refer to the extraordinary lack of resistance on the part of the victims during this cataclysmic period of capitalist social engineering. Yet none, as far as I know, has ever ventured in anything like a convincing answer to the really baffling question which must surely occur to anyone reading the history and record. Why was it the women, rather than the men, who offered such resistance as there was? In his book on the Highland Clearances, John Preble describes one such scene. Four miles down the glen, as they came through a wood by the march of Greenyard, their road was blocked by sixty or seventy women, with a dozen or less men standing behind them. The women had drawn their red shawls over their heads and were waiting silently. Taylor the fiscal and Stuart got down from the carriage and walked to the head of the police. Taylor shouted to the women in Gaelic and told them that they must clear the way for the law. And when they did not move, he took out the riot act and began to read it. The constables went forward with their truncheons lifted, and according to the Inverness Courier, which got the information from Taylor, the Strathcarran men immediately ran for the hills, leaving their women alone. Of all, some men must have remained, for two were injured and one was later charged. The absence of all the others is hard to condone. As it were at Cool Rain, Druids and elsewhere, the assault of the police was short, brutal and bloody. The courier again reporting Taylor perhaps said that there were 300 women there and that they were armed with sticks and stones if they were they were remarkably inefficient in the use of them, for no policeman suffered more than a bruise or a dented hat. These events took place in 1854. No wonder the Highlanders were disinclined to turn out to fight the Russians. During the war against the French Revolution and Napoleon, the Isle of Skye had furnished thousands of men for the forces. By 1937, Skye had contributed to the British Army 21 lieutenant generals and major generals, 48 lieutenant colonels, 600 majors captains and subalterns, 120 pipers, 10,000 non-commissioned officers and men. The Sutherlanders had fought under Gustavus Adolphus and became the fame of the armies of Europe. When one remembers the accounts of their martial spirit on the battlefields of Germany, Spain and the Low Countries, one asks oneself with incredulity why they did not defend their own homesteads. Your guess is as good as mine, and the following tentative explanation is offered with utmost diffidence. I do not think it is the whole truth, but it is part of the truth. First of all, one must get the Jacobite period into perspective. It is often said that the ancient clan society was destroyed at Culloden, and in a sense this is true, although the process of disintegration had begun long before However, it is easier to apply surgical methods to the body politic than to subvert the folkways of a millennium. Passing an act to abolish the heritable jurisdictions does not mean that you get rid automatically of the mental attitudes involved, either on the victim's side or on the side of the judges. Reading the accounts of some of the clearances, one gets an impression of the ritual of pit and gallows still in operation and a luckless clansman waiting to be toppled by the chief's crocodile executioner. There was occasional resistance, when the people were goaded to utter desperation, or when a resolute leader was thrown up. In 1849 at Solace, North Uist, there were wild riots, and here and there one finds reports of men such as Archibald du Macdonald, who threatened with eviction called up his seven stalwart sons, armed himself with a broadsword his grandfather had carried at Culloden, and defied both the law and his chief. But the general picture is one of almost masochistic apathy and defeatism. In 1832, evicted Chisholms living in Canada sent their chief an address of loyalty. Although he had just finished throwing half his remaining clansmen out of Strathglass, it was not till the 1880s with the Battle of the Braes and Skye and the sending of warships to the Minch 
that resistance assumed proportions serious enough to force government action, and ultimately to secure the passing of the Crofters Act of 1886. Incidentally, the record of the evictions of Knoydart, Strathglass and Glengarry makes it clear that there is no truth in the statement one occasionally encounters that there was more resistance in Catholic areas than in Protestant. So why, you may well ask, were things so different in Ireland? To that, the short answer must surely be that in Ireland the landlords were felt to be, as indeed in many cases they often were, foreigners, whereas in Scotland the ex-proprietors and savagers were in the main the old ancestral clan chiefs themselves. In spite of their galloping Anglicisation and the inner erosion of their patriarchal status, the chiefs were still felt to be the clan fathers. McGill Callum or McShamus Chatty or whatever to whom obedience and allegiance were owed. It is when we examine the role of the women in resisting the evictors that the folklorist begins to feel he might be able to offer the historians some revealing evidence. One of the most noticeable and most easily, easily documentable characteristics of Celtic tribal society from the early Irish heroic sagas onwards is the place in it of tough, strong-minded women. This is the hidden world of matriarchy exercising power indirectly, which existed over against the masculine authority of the chief. Curiously enough, it was when dealing with a subject from Celtic tribal history that Shakespeare drew the archetypal portrait of a hero who is outwardly all punish, pride and swagger, but who depends almost abjectly on his mettlesome wife at moments of crisis. Infirm of purpose, give me the daggers. At this point, we need to recapitulate what is known of the status of women and of their military prowess in early Celtic society. Polybius, writing in the second century before Christ, states that in time of war, the women of the Celts accompanied the men to battle, following them in wagons. The bellicose reputation of Gaulish women is attested by Amanius Marcellinus and an often quoted passage. Nearly all the Gauls are of lofty stature, fair and of ruddy complexion, terrible from the sternness of their eyes, very quarrelsome and of great pride and insolence. A whole troop of foreigners would not be able to withstand a single Gaul if he called his wife to assist his assistance, who is usually very strong, and with blue eyes especially when swelling her neck, gnashing her teeth, and brandishing her sallow arms of enormous size, she begins to strike blows mingled with kicks, as if they were so many missiles sent from the string of a catapult. The most formidable single opponent encountered by the Romans in Britain, with the possible exception of the Caledonian chief Calgacus, who commanded the northern tribes against Agricola at Mons Graupus, was the warrior queen Boudicca, who is thus described by Dio Cassius. She was huge of frame, terrifying of aspect, and with a harsh voice. A great mass of bright red hair fell to her knees. She wore a great twisted golden necklace and a tunic of many colours, over which was a thick mantle fastened by a brooch. Now she grasped a long spear to strike fear into all those who watched her. In the Celtic realms, an excellent comprehensive survey by Miles Dillon and Nora Chadwick, the high status of women in the Celtic world is continually emphasised. History and tradition alike echo the high prestige of women in Celtic mythology. In the heroic age of Ireland, Maeve, kin of Connacht, is the reigning sovereign. Ailil, her husband, is never more than her consort and Maeve is the greatest personality of any royal line of the heroic age. In Irish and Welsh stories of Celtic Britain, the great heroes are taught not only wisdom, but also feats of arms by women. In Irish saga, known as the Wooing of Emmer, Cúhillan is trained in all warrior feats by two warlike queens. Scaffa, who is also a faith 
i.e. a prophetess, an expert in supernatural wisdom, an athe. Among the ancient Picts, matrilinear succession was the rule till the 9th century. Bede tells us that even in his own day, whenever the royal succession among the Picts came in question, their ruler was chosen by succession from the female line. The most famous allusion to Celtic fighting women occurs in Tacitus' description of the Roman assault on the island of Anglesey in AD 61. Women and Druids were among the British warriors, drawn up to withstand the assault and to protect the island's sacred groves. After the battle, these groves were destroyed, an act untypical of Roman policy and suggesting a real fear of the Druids as inspirers of opposition. As Julius Caesar had put it a hundred years previously, Natio est omnis galorum ad modum dedita religion ibus. The whole Celtic people is greatly addicted to religion. The man's world of the Celts was also a warrior world, and the descriptions of it given by several classical authors tie in remarkably well with the information contained in the Gallic heroic sagas. Like many warrior societies, in which the young men are isolated from the women for long periods, trained from their earliest years in the use of arms, and brought up to vie with each other in battle and in the hunt, it was a society in which homosexuality seems to have been very widespread. The references of Greek and Latin historians to this subject are quite explicit, and have been a remarkable consistency. They are not as well known as might be expected, for the whole idea seems to have embarrassed Celtic scholars, much as the speech of Alcibiades in the banquet about his relations with Socrates is said to have been embarrassed and troubled poor Joet. Diodorus Siculus, writing in the first century before Christ, has this to say. The Celtic women are not only as tall as the men, but are just as courageous. But although they are attractive, the men are much keener on their own sex. They lie around in animal skins and enjoy themselves with a lover on each side. The extraordinary thing is that they haven't the smallest regard for their own personal dignity or self-respect. They offer themselves to other men without the least compunction. Furthermore, this isn't looked down on or regarded as in any way disgraceful. On the contrary, if one of them is rejected by another to whom he has offered himself, he takes offence. This information came to Diodorus from Posidonius, an historian who travelled through southern Gaul and observed Celtic folkways on the spot. Strabo, who died about AD 26, writes laconically that the young men in Gaul are shamelessly generous with their boyish charms, and Athenaeus, two centuries later, repeats the statement of Diodorus about the Celts' male bed partners. This evidence of homoerotic practices is an, un is an enclosed warrior society is of course in no way surprising. It is confirmed in the most striking manner by several passages in the great Irish heroic saga, Tombo Cooley, the Cattle Raid of Cooley. In the versions contained in the Yellow Book of Lecan, and more completely, in the Book of Leinster, the tale is told in the fight between Cúhulan and his ardent and adored foster brother, Ferdia, who face each other in heroic single combat at the ford. Ferdia does not want to fight Cúhulan, who has been his comrade in arms at the battle school of Scafach in Alba, Scotland. But Maeve, the Queen of Connacht, sells, sends poets and bards and satirists to bring the blushes to his cheek with mockery and insult and ridicule, so there would be nowhere in the world for him to lay his head in peace. When Cúhulan learns that Ferdia is on the way to fight him, he says, I swear I don't want a meeting, not because I fear him, but because I love him so much and before their first encounter he reminds them 
Fast friends, forest companions, we made one bed and slept one sleep, in foreign lands after the fray. Scaffa's pupils, two together, would set forth to comb the forest. In this verse, written down in Ireland more than a thousand years after Diodorus wrote the passage quoted above, we have an unmistakable echo in poetry. Of the rather ironic down-to-earth description of the heroic love in the Greek historian's prose, the combat of Ferdi and Cúhilin has been compared by Oda Black to the duel between Hector and Achilles, and Cúhilin's lament over the body of his lover to David's lament for Saul and Jonathan, the beauty of Israel is slain upon by high places. On another level, more in tune perhaps with the native temperament, one feels like repeating of the two champions. What Henry de Montferland once wittily remarked of the heroes of Satyricon, that they may be Burgress, but at any rate they are not de Merve Burgress. In the view of the enormous time gap to which we just alluded, it may be advisable at this point to recall Gordon Child's remark in Scotland before the Scots that human history comes not so much in ages as in stages. It should always be remembered that because of Ireland's relative isolation, Aboriginal Celtic folkways continued to flourish there right up until the early Middle Ages. Rudolf Portner puts it succinctly when he compares the protected survivals in Ireland, the off-off island, to life in a nature shoots park or nature reserve. The same general situation undoubtedly prevailed in many parts of the Scottish Highlands and Islands until even later, as voluminous folklore records testify. Ancestral memories of Celtic headhunting are still to be encountered in parts of Erter Hebrides, as are hangovers of some of the other phenomena we have been discussing. The plot of a folk tale MacNeil of Barra, the Widow's Son, and the Shetland Buck, which was recorded by the Coddy, the late John Macpherson, postmaster of North Bay, by John, John Lauren Campbell, contains some curious motifs. Much fascinating information about the sexual mores of medieval Celtic society is to be found in Kenneth Nichols' Gallic and Gallicised Ireland in the Middle Ages. The rights enjoyed by women under Brehon law, which continued to be operative in most parts of Ireland until the 17th century, although officially terminated in the statutes of Kilkenny in 1366, would be the envy of many women today. Women had the right of independent property ownership, could divorce and remarry with ease, and could be practitioners of the arts and sciences if they so desired. There was no such thing as an illegitimate child, a mother simply had to name the child, and if it was a son, he would inherit part of his father's property. Marriage was one of the keys to Irish women's independence, based as it was upon a complex series of property relations, which did not automatically involve property transfer from women to men. Nichols tells us that down to the end of the old order in 1603, what could be called Celtic secular marriage remained the norm in Ireland. Christian matrimony was no more than the rare exception grafted onto this system. According to Peter Truella, if a couple chose to part, all they had to do was stand back to back on the hill of Tailteen near Tara and walk away from each other. Trial mag- marriages were very common. Miles Dillon in the Celtic realms confirms the statements of the writers already quoted. The law of marriage in early Ireland is of special interest, as it shows in great measure the persistence of ancient customs in spite of Christian teaching. Divorce is freely allowed. Indeed, there is a trace of annual marriage. A marriage may always be ended by common consent. The practice of placing one's children in the care of foster parents was a normal feature of Irish society. And it was not confined to the noble class. The time of fosterage ended for boys at 17, for girls at 14, and they returned home 
Those who had been fostered together were bound in close relationship. This relationship with one's commality is a recurring motive in the sagas. Dr John McInnes informs me that until the forfeiture of the Lordship of the Isles at the end of the 15th century, a very similar judicial system must have prevailed over much of the Highlands. We know of a family of hereditary lawgivers, the Morrisons of Ness and Lewis, who after the Irish pattern acted as jurists for the Lordship. There can be no doubt these Brifamen were the far-off heirs of the learned men reported among the Celts of Gaul by Julius Caesar and Posidonius. That the women of Celtic Scotland were as combative as those of Ireland is attested by Hector Boes. The women wore of little less vastless in strength than was the men, and all rank madness and wifus, gif they wore nocht with child, ye thals wheel to battle as the men. In this splendid erudite book, A Midsummer's Eve's Dream, which is a discursive commentary on William Dunbar's poem, The Treaties of the Two Amara Women and the Widow, Professor A. D. Hope provides much information on the position of women in Scottish society at various periods in our history. He quotes the statement of Thomas Morer, who was chaplain to a Scottish regiment about 1689, and who wrote a short account of Scotland, that the women of Scotland are capable of estates and honours, and inherit both as well as the males, and therefore after marriage may retain their maiden name, and adds, the way in which women retained their own names and often their own property in Scotland impressed many travellers. It was perhaps the last afterglow of an age in which the real power had been theirs to exercise and enjoy. What light, if any, does all of this throw on the recurrent pattern of women's resistance to the clearers which are so amply documented? If I am on the right track, and I emphasise again that this is a theory, advanced tentatively, then there is more to the presence of the women on the front line than the obvious considerations that they were less likely to be clubbed by police and military, were in themselves, as wives and mothers, the most direct human reproach to the callousness and inhumanity of the evictors, and, to put it at its lowest, were less likely to be proceeded against than the men. All these are valid points, but they are not enough to explain this very perceptible pattern. Surely it is only completely explicable as another relic from the mental world of the shattered tribal system. It was the women's world which stood in with all its spirit, courage and resilience when the man's world faltered. The swashbuckling man's world of chief gilly wet foot and arms toting doing uasal had come unstuck, finally unstuck, on Dramothy Moor, not long after it was to be taken over lock, stock and powder horn by the British army. The hidden matriarchal woman's world. Of whose splendour, vigour, splendid vigour, we have so much evidence in Gaelic song poetry, had remained intact. And when the men took to the bray in ignominious serve couprout on the appearance of the Baton Brigade, it provided a fragile last line of resistance before the fire raisers moved in. It was as if they meant to show that if the men were not prepared to defend hearth and home, they were. The male who does appear in baleful prepotent pride on the scene of the clearances is, alas, on the oppressor's side. Haranguing his cowed subjects from a high wooden throne and threatening them with hellfire if they disobey those set in authority over them. He is the Calvinist minister. This sinister character can well and truly be regarded as the devil of the peace while lambasting the people for their sins and openly suggesting that they are being made to suffer because of them, he is quite capable at the same time of angling for an extension to his gleep. Arnold MacLeod informs us in Gloomy Memories that during the famine of 1836, the Reverend Hugh Mackenzie, 
moderator of the Presbytery of Tun, exchanged part of his glebe for more extensive property, but in consenting to the change he made an express condition that the present occupiers, amounting to eight families, should be removed, and accordingly they were driven out in a body. And so it was the woman who, in accordance with Aboriginal Celtic tradition, defied the invaders of the world, the venal Calvinist ministers and the crowbar-wielding minions of the gentry with no pity. However, their appearance in the front line raises a number of questions to which one would be glad to have the answer. Where were the children and babies during such scenes as that at Strathcarran? Who was looking after them? In this connection, one must also take into consideration several reports, factual news reports as well as folk narratives, that men dressed as women took part in episodes of resistance. One hesitates to believe that the heroes of Badayoz or Waterloo or their relatives would dress themselves in women's attire because they lacked civil courage. In Ireland, the Molly Maguires were the most belligerent of transvestites. Was this an example of military camouflage, the better to do down the aggressor? Be that as it may, one could wish, reading the accounts of some of the clearances and their pitiful consequences, that the seven battalions of the Finn Galleons had been deployed in battle array against the rapacious chieftain landlords and their factors and minions, rather than this petticoat brigade. Donald Ross, a Glasgow royer, went to Skye after the Borig and Susanish evictions of 1853, carrying with him large quantities of food and clothing for the people. His account of his experiences was published in a pamphlet, Real Scottish Grievances, the following year. He saw seven children, all under the age of 11, lying in a shed on a collection of rubbish, fern, meadow hay, straw, pieces of old blanket and rags of clothing. Rain and snow fell upon them. They were so thin and so light, he said, that he could have carried them all in his arms for a quarter of a mile without feeling their weight. And what were the sanctimonious Calvinist mullahs doing when all these dreadful things were taking place on their manse doorsteps? The discreditable truth, with very few exceptions, is nothing, or practically nothing. The record of the Free Kirk is better than that of the established church in this context. One cannot avoid the conclusion, from much of the evidence available, that the judgment of the Lord, fulminations of the ministers, tended to induce a hopeless apathetic subjection in the minds of their flocks, and sap their will to resist the oppressors. The moral is that no one surveying this whole subject can afford to leave out of the picture the peculiar psychology of Scots Calvinism, how it can both energise and hypnotise, and at worst, make thoroughly apathetic. G.K. Chesterton gave gnomic expression to the inner truth of the matter when he wrote in the honour of Israel Go. Scotland has a double dose of the poison called heredity, the sense of blood in the aristocrat, and the sense of doom in the Calvinist. When the people of Glen Glen Calvi were evicted in May 1985, 45, May 1845. They sought refuge in Croik Kirkyard and they scratched a few messages for posterity on the window panes. The most pathetic and in many ways the most revealing of these reads as follows. Glen Calvi people, the wicked generation. It seems clear that there were a lot of hidden and open persuaders who wanted the people to believe that what had hit them was a sort of divine scourge, and that resistance offered to the landlords was tantamount to resistance offered to the Lord. I suspect that women were less susceptible to the powers of the sinister hoodoo than were their menfolk. The women, as we have seen, were the bearers of very old traditions of custom and belief, that were deeply antagonistic to the puritanical and essentially father figure church. It was a woman, Mary Macpherson, Mary Moore Nanoran, who wrote the most poignant lament for the older Scotland shattered by the clearances. However, in our own day, 
A male poet, T.S. Law, has written in English a poem on the same subject, which strikes a quite individual note of lyric elegy and of true Swiftian saeva indignatio. I conclude by quoting it in full, the clearances. Hear how the names sing, MacDonald, Clanranald. Hear how the names sing, Argyll and Lochiel. Hear them, hear them, MacLeod and Glengarry. Hear them, Bailey, MacDonald and Ross. These are the names that ennobled their line. These are the oar come in old lang syne. These are the names of the traitors and tinkers. These are the merciless murdering swine. These the destroyers, the deaf heads, blood drinkers. These are the oar come in old lang syne. These are the names that ennobled their line. Listen to Drummond, Bridalbin and Athol. Listen to Hamilton, Balfour and Innes. Listen and hear Sutherland, Fraser. Listen, Matheson, Seaforth, Robertson. These are the names that ennobled their line. These are the oar come in old lang syne. These are the cannibals, heart cruel savagers, their highlanders' bodies and souls meat and wine. These the procurers of gentleness, ravishers. These are the oar come in old lang syne. These are the names that ennobled their line.